Now I've titled this little talk all together now, one, two, three. And there's a reason for titling it like that. Because Babylon consists of three components. There's the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And they will come together at the end of time and inaugurate that which is the counterfeit of what God has initiated. But there are other aspects of the three as well. You see, the devil is a, is a counterfeiter, but he's also the master of reversal. He likes to reverse everything that God has put in place and reverse it so brilliantly that it looks like righteousness, when in actual fact it is an abomination. And the number three is very important because God is described as three persons in the Bible, and the devil has his counterfeit. You have the dragon, which represents the father, you have the beast, which represents the son, and you have the false prophet, which represents the Holy Spirit. And then there are also political aspects that come in three. So I want to start right from the beginning. And I know I'm going to be in trouble, but that's okay. I'm always in trouble. I'm used to it. Genesis 1 verse 27, And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created in him, male and female created in them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every green tree that thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So there are a few things that God inaugurated in Eden. Firstly, he created them male and female. But the rules and the covenant were transferred to Adam, before Eve was even there. Adam received dominion before Eve was even created. He gave names to all the animals. And the covenant was with man and was to be transferred to everything that is in the sphere of power that God had created. And the woman was flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. They were to be as one, but there was a hierarchy. In Genesis chapter 8, verse 18, And Noah went forth, and his sons, and his wife, and his sons' wives with him. And I like the way Randy Skeet explained this situation. When it came to the redemption in the ark, the wives are mentioned as many times as the men are mentioned. But when it comes to the covenant, it is always with the men. And what he did before the flood, he repeated after the flood. Genesis 9 verse 1, And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth. And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And behold, I establish my covenant with you, and with your seed after you. It doesn't say there with Noah and his son and his wives. They were there by implication because they were bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. But the covenant was something that was handed down in a hierarchical system that God had set up. And it was called the patriarchal system. And it's not very favorably viewed in the days that we live in. Now it wasn't because the women were not capable. It wasn't that they weren't spiritual enough. None of those criteria mattered. It was simply a hierarchy that God had set in place, as he has with the angelic host as well. And even in the Godhead, there's God the Father, there's God the Son, and then you had various categories of angels. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3 said, I but would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, 
and the head of Christ is God. So there is a hierarchy in the Bible. And if we go to Genesis, God established his covenant through the man and he gave dominion and the earth was subject to man. And he created them male and female and he said that through this union he would share his creative capacity with humanity. Now, there was something else that was also instituted in Eden. Genesis chapter 2 verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in that, in it, he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So, the marriage union, the covenant, the earth, dominion over the earth, and the Sabbath, all were instituted in Eden. And they set the tone for the entire existence of mankind. Now, do you think that the devil would hate everything that was instituted in Eden? And as the master of reversal, he would want to take the whole plan and reverse it and set it up in a different fashion. And before he can set up his kingdom, he must be able to do this. And it must incorporate not only the physical aspects, it must incorporate also the spiritual aspects. Because his kingdom is not only a physical, it's also a spiritual kingdom. So, if God instituted the marriage, and God instituted dominion over the earth, and when all these things had been done, he instituted the Sabbath of rest, to rest in the completed works of God, in other words, the, sta the Sabbath really stands for righteousness by faith. Because there's nothing I can add to the creation and there's nothing I can add to the eventual recreation after the fall of man. It's a complete work that God did and not man. So the Sabbath becomes the symbol of rest. So what God has instituted, Satan will want to negate. He will want to negate the dominion. He will want to negate the institution of marriage. He will want to negate the Sabbath. And then he will have set up a kingdom in counterfeit to this kingdom. Now in Daniel, we read about the kingdoms as they will arise upon the earth. And each kingdom had its opportunity and then was replaced by another kingdom. I've had this uh, statue modified slightly because whenever you look at the statue in the books, he's always standing with his legs nicely together. And uh, I didn't like that, so I had one made where you spread the legs. Because one of the feet is sitting in Rome, but if you go to the Roman Empire, it also had a seat in the east, in Constantinople. And this kingdom is a universal kingdom, so it saddles the whole earth. And he's firmly entrenched not only in the east, but also in the west. But in the ten toes are epitomized the Roman Empire in its western form, which will eventually control through its norms and its standards the entire world. Now who came out of that western European Empire? Is it just Europe? Or is it the countries associated with Europe? What about the United States of America? Isn't it settled largely with Europeans? Or wasn't it originally when the constitutions were framed? What about uh, Southern Africa? What about Australia and New Zealand? So that's the one aspect. And then you have the other aspect the eastern component, 
and the feet are made of iron and clay. Now if we read in the spirit of prophecy, it says there, iron and clay is the mingling of churchcraft and statecraft. We have to read this carefully. We've come to a time when God's sacred work is represented by the feet of the image in which the iron was mixed with the miry clay. God has a people, a chosen people, whose discernment must be sanctified, who must not become unholy by laying upon the foundation wood, hay, and stubble. So there's something that we have to do that's different to what the world does. Every soul who is loyal to the commandments of God will see that the distinguishing feature of our faith is the seventh-day Sabbath. If the government would honor the Sabbath as God has commanded, it would stand in the strength of God in defense of the faith once delivered to the saints. But statesmen will uphold the spurious Sabbath and will mingle their religious faith with the observance of this child of the papacy placing it above the Sabbath which the Lord has sanctified and blessed, setting it apart for man to keep holy as a sign between him and his people to a thousand generations. The mingling of churchcraft and statecraft is represented by the iron and the clay. Now, so often we want to say that the clay are the weak elements of the political systems and the iron are the strong parts. But this is not what the Bible really teaches, nor what the spirit of prophecy says. The clay is churchcraft. The iron is statecraft. And the two are constantly trying to work together to set up a counterfeit kingdom. But they will not cleave, except for a brief moment at the end, when everybody gives their power unto the system. This investing the church with the power of the state, will bring evil results. Men have almost passed the point of God's forbearance. They have invested their strength in politics and have united with the papacy. But the time will come when God will punish those who have made void his law and their evil work will recoil upon themselves. So how close are we to this togetherness, this final push? And what is the ideology that will finally bring it about? Well, in the book Education we read, at the same time, anarchy is seeking to sweep away all law. Not only divine, but human. The centralizing of wealth and power, one aspect. The vast combinations for the enriching of the few at the expense of the many. The combination of the poorer classes for the defense of their interests and claims. The spirit of unrest, of riot and bloodshed. The worldwide dissemination, and this is interesting, of the same teachings that led to the French Revolution are all tending to involve the whole world in a struggle similar to that which convulsed France. Now, do we have all of these in the world today? Do we have the centralization of wealth and power? Yes. But who did the wealth and power centralization? Do we have combinations for the enriching of the few against the many? Yes. Do we have combinations of poorer classes to defend their interests in the form of trade unions, etc.? Yes, we do. Do we have a spirit of unrest? You only have to look at the news. Do we have riots? Do we have bloodshed? And do we have the same teachings as we had during the French Revolution? And the answer is yes, to every single one of them. In fact, Condoleezza Rice said that even the Bush administration's main task was to complete the work of the French Revolution. Now we're living in a, in a cataclysmic time. Now, whether these are acts of demonic powers or whether these are planned is irrelevant. The fact of the matter is that a Hegelian dialectic is being used to channel the mindset of man in a particular direction. As the Masonic fraternity says, Ordo ab chao, out of the chaos you create the order that you want. 
But in order to get people to have the same mindset, you must first channel, channel them through the chaos. So it's not only in the Western world that we see catastrophes, we see it in the Eastern world as well. Bombing that killed more than 200, deadliest attack in Baghdad in years. People have no morality left, no feeling for humanity. Life is meaningless. People will kill for anything. Just this week, 84 killed in France after the truck plows through the crowd ce celebrating Bastille Day. I found that rather fascinating that it was on Bastille Day when this happened. And uh, it celebrates, of course, the French Revolution. And what about the killings of all those people that attended the concert in France just a short while before this latest catastrophe? Band playing Kiss the Devil at Paris terrorist attack. Eagles of Death Metal addresses tragedy for the first time. So while they were playing the Eagles of Death, the song Kiss the Devil, the gunman plowed down some of the guests. Orlando Gay nightclub shooting, 50 killed. Suspect is Omar Mateen. And the world is in turmoil. It doesn't know which way to turn. Some people say, are these the judgments of God? Some people are saying, is this the world gone mad? Religious protesters result in the band Rotting Christ changing their name for their South African gig, which took place this month. This band travels the world and they are on an international tour to make sure that uh, everybody understands whose side they're on. Now the very name was so repulsive that they had to change it for the South African gigs. But their name is Rotting Christ. What does that say? It's a, it's a, a Greek band. And what they are saying is that Christ was never resurrected. This is wishful thinking by the devil. And every person who watches the media and sees what is going on must realize that the world cannot continue as it continues. And everybody wants a way out. We want a way out of, of gender violence. We want a way out of racial violence. We want a way out of religious violence. Can't we just come together and stop this insanity? And the greater the insanity, the greater the need to come together. Isn't this exactly what the devil wants to? Isn't this a brilliant plot? If you look at this uh, picture on one of their albums of these terrible demonic figures and uh, they have the words there, kataton, aimona, whatever, meaning literally to follow your own demon. In other words, to follow the spirit that leads you, the demonic force that leads you. The world is heading towards a precipice and these obscene activities taking a place in the world and this senseless violence is channeling the thinking, Christian, religious, whatever religion, minded person in a particular direction. And that direction is unity. So we have to come together. We have to stop this insanity. And when uh, those policemen were killed in the United States, Obama defends the back Black Lives Matter protests at Police Memorial in Dallas. And some people criticized him and said he, s he spurned the fire and he actually uh, supported some of the violence in this way. So he was heavily criticized, but the matter is, in fact, in the media, 
there is racial divide, not only in the United States of America, but in every nation on this planet. And the media says it fell to former President George W. Bush, a resident of Dallas, to provide a less political message that focused on unifying the country out of grief. And I'm surprised at his speech because he was not so well known for his uh, oratory skills, but he did something quite marvelous here. Mr. Bush said the nation is proud of the slain officers and then he praised them for their duties that they had done. And then he said, referring to racial divisions, roiling the country, Mr. Bush said, Americans must work at finding our better selves. Too often we judge other groups by their worst examples while judging ourselves by our best intentions. Mr. Bush said, at our best, we know we have one country, one future, one destiny. We recognize that we are brothers and sisters sharing the same brief moment on earth. We do not want the unity of grief, nor do we want the unity of fear. We want the unity of hope, affection, and high purpose. I think it's a good speech. I think every person on this planet longs for this high purpose. People are sick and tired of violence. They're sick and tired of fear. They're sick and tired of grief. Obama gay marriage legacy. White House lit up with rainbow after same-sex marriage ruling. So the nation celebrated when he brought in this ruling and the cartoonists had quite a bit of fun. They said, well, if you look at the legacy of JFK, then it was one small step for man, <coughs> pointing to the moon landing and what he had achieved in his tenure, and Obama, they have one giant leap for mankind where they have the transvestite sneaking out of the woman's restroom. And they ask, is this the legacy? Well, what did this legislation actually do? Which legislation did it negate? It negated what God had put in place in Eden. So God had said, He created them, male and female. They shall become one flesh. The man shall cleave unto his wife. And this was a covenant before God. This has been reduced to a judicial agreement which can be annulled at any time. The South African courts actually went further and ensured that there could be no recourse in the case of a divorce against one or the other party because everybody is totally free to choose whomsoever they wish. Now in the past, if someone destroyed your marriage and you had tremendous financial implications, you could sue the other party no longer because it is only a legal agreement in the context of a material sense for the time in which they are together. It's no longer a binding contract before God. So the marriage has been annulled via this legislation. Now, this happened in the United States and in, in most other countries as well. But this person says, why Obama will go down as one of the greatest presidents of all times. So this is a news commentator. And uh, he has some interesting things to say. It's uh, maybe hard to imagine now, but in the face of rising chaos, we'll crave unity all the more. And in future years, whoever can speak most convincingly of unity will rise to the top. It's also hard to imagine many beating Obama at the game. This year's carnival election with Trump as a kind of debauched circus barker only makes the distinction clearer. The absurdity and car crash spectacle of it all have already lent Obama an out-and-out-of-time quality, as if he were a creature from another loftier century. Whatever happens next, I feel this is in my bones. We'll look back at history 
Hopefully when we're zooming down the Barack Obama Hyperloop transport system and think that man was rare and we were damn lucky to have him. Interesting statement. The Jesuit Pierre Teilhard de Chardin said, driven by the forces of love, the fragments of the world seek each other so that the world may come to be. So you first fragment the world with chaos and disorder, and then you pick up the fragments in people who crave nothing more than unity. He also said the outcome of the world, the gates of the future, the entry into the superhuman, these are not thrown open to a few of the privileged, nor to one chosen people to the exclusion of all others. They will open only to an advance of all together in a direction in which all together can join and find completion in a spiritual renovation of the earth. The world has to come together. This chaos has to stop. This pain, this grief has to end. And then you have these two interesting characters. Sparring continuously in the media. Vying for the most powerful position in the political sphere. And uh, they don't have very nice things to say about each other. But of course they are actually friends. They visit each other at their homes, they play golf together, they party together, they laugh together. They're house friends. You can look it up on the web, it's very interesting, there are many, many pictures. But there's an interesting contrast that is being portrayed. The one contrast is, let's become inclusive, let's find space for one another, and let's take care of the marginalized. And the other one is, let's build walls, let's separate, let's, etc. And these two ideologies are facing each other squarely in this election. And then you have in the mix a man like Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders heads to the Vatican for conference. Sanders said in an interview with Associated Press that he was a appreciative and proud to be invited to the conference organized by the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences and that he has long admired the teachings of Pope Francis. Now, Bernie Sanders is a Jew, but he likes Pope Francis. He will join several speakers commemorating the 25th anniversary of Centissimus Annus, a high-level teaching document by Pope John Paul II, on the economy and social justice at the end of the Cold War. The theme from the conference, which is essentially how we create a moral economy, is one that has occupied my attention for decades, and the teachings from Pope Francis have moved me very much, said the senator. So the ideology that he wants to bring into government is a papal ideology of social justice which in many lectures which I've given before have been shown to be totally contrary to every tenant of the word of God. But this is what the world is crying out for because there is so much social injustice. First you create it and then you use it to get the iron and the clay to cleave together. Because if churchcraft and statecraft don't come together to do this together, the world will never see it. It's interesting that he kept on with his campaign even though he was far behind and could no longer win the presidential race. Yet he continued to the very last moment and his reason that he gave was to make sure that the ideologies that he stood for would be implemented in the party, the Democratic Party, no matter who ran. And when that was accomplished, he finally endorsed Hillary Clinton. So Hillary Clinton is probably the best candidate for the next presidency of the United States. Although if the other one wins, it doesn't really matter 
because they are cut from the same cloth, they're even from the same family, the same royal family, so they have the right bloodlines to be president, whether they are Trumps or whether they are Clintons. It doesn't really matter. But the, the ideology is important. And then we've seen some very interesting history which uh, sort of shook many people's pockets, even small people's pockets, the so-called Brexit. And I heard so many of our own people saying, well, this is the final falling apart of the iron and the clay, and uh, people are coming to their senses and moving away from the new world order. But there's something wrong here, because prophecy says the kings of the world will give their power unto the beast. So what was Brexit all about? And why should Britain separate itself when Ireland does not separate itself, when Scotland wants to secede, maybe, and even go to the European Union, why is it essential that Britain should be separate from the European Union? Well, I don't know if any of you have seen a previous video of mine called The Beamable Sustainable Princes, which deals with the history of Britain and the Reformation and how eventually the Reformation capitulated to the papal power, and Britain is actually a crown territory, which means that it's subject legally, by documentation, to Rome and no one else. What does this mean? Well, let's have a look at the outgoing Prime Minister. Cameron's legacy. How will you remember him? We've looked at Obama's. David Hassel in Birmingham believes David Cameron will always be remembered first and foremost as the Prime Minister who held a referendum about Britain's membership in the EU. He'll be remembered as the Prime Minister who bet the future of the country on a referendum, the real aim of which was to sort out Eurosceptics within his own party. He lost that bet and as a result forced the country out of the EU, possibly leading to the eventual breakup of the UK itself. That's not a legacy to be proud of, says the media. Is it, or is it planned? What's the other legacy? Johnny Thompson in Cardiff believes David Cameron should be praised for introducing gay marriage. As the member of the lesbian, gay, etc. community, I'll always remember David Cameron as the Prime Minister who finally introduced gay marriage into the United Kingdom. His social poli policies in modernizing the Conservative Party and protecting vulnerable minority groups such as my own is a feature of his premiership which I hope is not forgotten. Mr. Cameron essentially made me proud not only to be British but proud to be myself. That is invaluable. He writes, he legalized gay marriage, but it wasn't even in the Tory manifesto and against the wishes of many of his own MPs. Why is it so important that this legislation should be introduced in the entire world? Now, I'm not here to criticize anybody's lifestyle. I'm just here to state what God said. And God had a sick particular standard. And God had a particular way in which he distributed the roles. And here, this has been officially negated in the entire world. So the one aspect that was introduced in Eden has been done away with. The dominion will be done away with when it comes to the charter that has been signed with regard to climate change. Because their dominion is transferred from man over the environment to the environment over man. So that has been taken away with. What's the third aspect that must be taken away with? The Sabbath. Because the Sabbath is a symbol of rest in the completed works of Christ. This system is a system where man intercedes on behalf of man and takes over the role which God has, in a spiritual realm, assigned to mankind. Who runs the world? Women. 
now I'm on dangerous ground here, but it's just a fact that women are more and more prominent in politics in the world today. As Theresa May became Prime Britain's Prime Minister Wednesday, the world is one step closer to being run by women. Well, only on the surface, because behind the scenes there are, there are others who actually run the show. May join, joins German Chancellor Angela Merkel, who leads Europe's largest economy and has worked to unify the continent in the face of a multitude of recent global crises. As a woman governing a major European country, and if Hillary Clinton is elected president in November, three of the world's most influential nations would be run by women for the first time. In fact, the ten toes that the Bible is concerned with will be run by women. Now, there's nothing wrong with a woman running it. There's nothing uh, that suggests that a woman is not as capable as a man. That's not the point. The point is, it is a fulfillment of what the Bible says. So will three women run the world? Isaiah 3 verse 12, As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O my people, they which lead thee, cause thee to err, and destroy the way of thy paths. You know what? Men deserve that the women rule. Because men have usurped the position that has been given to them by God. Not to lord it over people, but to rule by compassion and kindness in the image of Christ. Husbands, love your wife, your wives. And love is not self-seeking, and it never seeks to harm anyone. And we're living in a planet that is lying in tatters. So, God says, let the woman rule. Now, it's very interesting about this lady. May Day, time for amendment of life. Some changes have to come. The world cannot continue as it has. Why did they vote for Brexit? The Jesuits in Britain, their magazine, say, we have a deal. Referring to the COP21 deal of the environment where the environment takes precedent over man. Every single thing that God instituted in Eden is being negated. We're just waiting for the final one. The news media writes, Christians may in particular think that Theresa May's family background, she is the daughter of a vicar, the same as Angela Merkel, will have given her a true understanding of what it is to serve. Church of England incumbents make a huge contribution to the well-being of everyone who lives in their parishes, not just those who attend church or profess the Christian faith. This is the real work of Christ, and it is this that Theresa May grew up witnessing day after day. Theresa May has also set her vision of reform, the success of which depends on the workings of the authoritative parliament that truly represents and serves the people. It is not entirely original, she is repeating the substance of what one of the greatest party chairmen said to a conservative conference at a party and government set out to find a new agenda after de Gaulle vetoed Britain's application to join the European community. She echoes MacLeod when she says, In Britain today, if you are born poor, you will die on average nine years earlier than others. If you are black, you're treated more harshly by the criminal justice system than if you're white. If you're a white, working-class boy, you're less likely than anybody else to go to university. If you're at a state school, you're less likely to reach the top profession than if you're educated privately. If you're a woman, you still earn less than a man. If you suffer from mental health problems, there's too often not enough help to hand. If you're young, you'll find it harder than ever before to own your own home. These are all burning injustices and I'm determined to fight against them. There are, of course, many things that Theresa May has said and done which Christians can disagree, but no Christian can disagree with this agenda. We know that Theresa May will not succeed on her own. We should pray that she is given the grace and strength of the Holy Spirit and implore the saints to come to her 
aid so that she might facilitate amendments of life in these islands. Question. Do they want churchcraft and statecraft to come together to solve the problems of humanity? To straighten out the injustices that have been created in the first place in order to lead men into this dialectic thinking pattern? Well, what does the media say about the old Tory party? The media says, this is the Guardian. I mean, this is one of the biggest newspapers there. They say money is the only God the Tories want us to worship on a Sunday. There's no spirituality. Everything is just money and the rich must get richer and the poor can go and get poorer and it doesn't matter and these social injustices must continue. No, we need a rethink. Where must we go? Well, this is where we want to go. So why is Sunday special? The Christian answer is more complicated than expected. Every Christian moved their day of rest. The early Christians moved their day of rest from the seventh day of the week to the first day, from Saturday to Sunday, despite the fourth command and commandment mandating Saturday. Isn't this interesting? I, the seventh day Sabbath observance, this move was partly a way of honoring the resurrection which happened on the first day of the week, partly about distinguishing Christianity from Judaism, and partly a way of colonizing the posh Roman sun-worshipping day. So they've got the history straight. But it also conveniently distanced Christianity and its new imperial friends from all that dangerously redistributive stuff about the Jubilee, to which the Sabbath is fundamentally connected for the seventh day of the week corresponds to the seventh day of creation when God rested from this derives. Rest on the seventh day, one. Rest for the land on the seventh year. We just discussed this. This is interesting. Which on the Jewish calendar is this year. And three, the forgiveness of all debt, the jubilee on the seventh time, seventh year. When is the greatest jubilee year in the history of the modern world going to take place? Next year. 2017. What did the Pope call this year? A special year of mercy. When the door of mercy will be open for everyone to accept this mercy so that we can go into the Jubilee. Is the world being prepared for something very particular? We just asked the questions in the lessons that we studied. Is this our duty? To set these things right in a materialistic sense. Where are we going? This is how the world thinks. The stories you need to read in one handy email read more. This last is the big one. The so-called year of the Lord's favor. It's what the Jubilee jet ca debt campaign referred back to when it called for the eradication of developing world debt. It's also what Jesus <coughs> refers to in his first very first sermon, I come to bring good news to the poor, freedom to the captive. Now you are literalizing <coughs> spiritual words of Christ. This is a Jesuit application of a spiritual directive which God has given. I come to bring good news to the poor, freedom to the captive, and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is not some niche bit of scripture. It's the key that unlocks the whole meaning of the Jesus movement. And it is fundamentally and unavoidably antithetical to modern capitalism. It has to go the way we've been doing business has to go. The Jubilee is not debt restructuring. It's out and out full on debt forgiveness. No wonder the business minister isn't so keen. We need a new form of government. We need new thinking. Maybe the women can do it. Washington, D.C., do we have the same thinking in Washington? Did you know that Washington, D.C., the city of London, and the Vatican are not just capitals or in capitals, they are sovereign nations, totally independent sovereign nations. Now, I have a whole lecture on that, the Pimable Sustainable Princes. All three of them, of course, have a territory. All three of them have a particular duty. All three of them have similar structures. The city of London, 
has uh, the uh, obelisk. The Washington Monument is the obelisk. And the Vatican has its obelisk. All three of them are totally independent cities. All three of them have a particular geographical area, a city-state, independent city-state with its own laws, its own constitutions, its own police force. In the case of the Vatican, it's the Swiss Guard, which, by the way, is also a representative of the banking system and its own flag. When it comes to the city of London, the heart of the city of London, then it has its own coat of arms and it has its own geographical area with its own elections and its own bylaws, an independent city-state and its own flag. And the dragons and uh, we serve and all of these things are rather fascinating when you look at that history, but that's not part of this lecture. So this is called the Corporation of London. Like Vatican City, London's financial district is also a privately owned corporation or city-state located right smack in the heart of Greater London. It became a sovereign state in 1694 when King William III of Orange privatized and turned the Bank of England over to the bankers. And maybe it needs a king. Maybe it needs a King William. I wonder. Would be interesting if it could get a King William. Let's have a look what Wikipedia says about London Corporation, City of London Corporation. The City of London Corporation, officially and legally the mayor and commonality and citizens of the City of London, is the municipal governing body of the City of London, the historic centre of London and the location of much of the UK's financial sector. The Rothschild banks are there and Rothschild stands for Red Shield, Rot Schild. Red Shield. And if you look at the Jewish Encyclopedia, it says Vatican Bankers. In 2006, the name was changed from Corporation of London to avoid confusion with the wi wider London local government. It's a totally separate government. The Greater London Authority. The corporation is probably the world's oldest continuous elected local government authority. Both businesses and residents of the city, or square mile as it's called, are entitled to vote in the elections, and in addition to its functions as the local authority, analogous to those undertaken by the brows that administer the rest of London, it takes responsibility for supporting the financial services, industry, and representing its interests. And it has a Lord Mayor, a court, and a council, and all of the necessary uh, components to make it an independent state. Now it's interesting that the former mayor of London, Boris Johnson, was pro-Brexit. And uh, David Cameron was anti-Brexit. And we're wondering, are they cleaving to each other? Are they not cleaving to each other? It has nothing to do with this. Because the cleaving has to do with churchcraft and statecraft. And why is it necessary that Britain should actually be separate? And why would Boris Johnson be in the know? Well, as a leading figure in an independent state, as the former mayor, and as a Bilderberger, he should know what the agenda is, the Bilderbergers having been created by the Jesuits, by Josef Heronim Rettinger, and... Uh, why was he pro-Brexit? Does the New World Order need a separate state as a figurehead state, as Prince Charles was supposed to be? And then he was made the Foreign Secretary by the new Prime Minister. And uh, as Secretary, as Foreign Secretary, he wields a tremendous amount of power because he will be dealing on a one-to-one -one basis with the great powers of the world, including the Russians and the Chinese and all of this. And who is the new Lord Mayor who's taken his place? Well, this is the official government webpage. Mayor of London, the role of executive 
London's strategic authority is to promote economic development and wealth creation, social development, and the improvement of the environment. The mayor also has various other duties in relations to culture and tourism, and now it is Sadiq Khan, who happens to be a Muslim. And it's interesting, if you get to the 32nd degree in Freemasonry, well then you become a shrine of Freemason, if that is your portfolio, and then you swear allegiance, not on the Bible, but on the Quran, and you don affairs, which says Allah. Rumors have emerged Britain's Queen Elizabeth is set to retire, so says the media, and intends to pass the crown over to Prince William and Kate Middleton. Britain's Queen Elizabeth, who just celebrated, etc., etc., the reigning monarch, she wants to hand over directly to her grandson, Prince William. It's interesting that uh, the Prince of Orange, William III, actually created this independent state, which is really subject to the crown. And the crown, legally, is the Vatican, and not Britain. The Queen owns no crown. She is subject to the crown. The news came from reports the Queen had made it known she was planning to step down and skip over her son, Prince Charles, turning over the crown to the second in line to the throne, his son, Prince William. Now in the higher circles, it has always been stated that the British royalty should become a figurehead royalty for the entire world. And maybe it has to be separate from the other nations in order to fulfill that role. In fact, they would make a very nice couple and a very nice example to the world to look up to this youthful new endeavor of church and state working together. Now, the third little state is the District of Columbia in the United States. It also has its own territory within Washington, the District of Columbia. It has its own police force. It has its own flag. And there are three stars on the flag. All together now. One, two, three. You see, the District of Columbia is the political powerhouse of this new order. The Vatican is the religious powerhouse and it wields the sword of the spirit to which the sword of the state is subject. And here lies the military and political clout of the system. London is the powerhouse of the economic system. So all the economics of the world are controlled by an independent corporation in London that is subject to the Jesuits. And this one is also subject to the Jesuits. In fact, you will see that it has been donated from Jesuit land, which is Maryland. And the whole seat of government is totally legally separate from the United States. And the territory is what is called the D.C. Mall. And here's an aerial photograph where you have the great obelisk and uh, the buildings associated with it, like the Capitol over there. And this is from Wikipedia, and it's called the Mall. So when great gatherings take place at the Mall, then it's not just a United States gathering. It is the gathering of the elites that pull the strings of government. Now what great meeting is taking place on this very day on which I am talking? And this gets to be fascinating to me. First let's have a look at the Pittsburgh Gazette. We've looked at what the Londoners had to say about Sunday. Let's see what the Pittsburgh Gazette had to say about Sunday. There's no argument or question that our country was founded on Christian values that have eroded over the years. Uh, a Gazette article is illustrative. Church fading away after mu, more than a century of worship. The subhead says the first Presbyterian church in struggling Clareton will close on the 27th of December, etc. Another article about the merit of religion appeared in December 20 forum saying religion is good for families and kids. 
our Congress should revisit and our candidates for president should consider advocating the restoration of Sunday as a day of rest, a paid day of rest, a required day of rest. Now we have the distraction of unnecessary shopping. And in the not too distant past, non-essential business establishments were required to be closed on Sunday. Americans deserve a day of rest, a day to be with families, attend church and interact with people on an interpersonal level. Imagine shutting down the internet or cell phones, cell phones for the day, how peaceful that would be. We have made a truly negative rat race with limited time available for potential for good interactions with one another. We need to restore one takeaway from our past. Sunday as a day of rest, a day of worship, of prayer, that was invaluable to our family values and individual well-being. The odds are regretfully that our Sunday tradition of the past are gone forever, just as the odds that presidential candidates would even think of Sunday as an essential need. Merry Christmas. Well, what's going to take place at the mall? Today. Together, 2016 aims to unify one million Christians in prayer on the National Mall. Now, this is very important because it's not just anywhere. This is the central government of the papal power establishing a meeting on its territory. This is a signal to the world as to where we are going. It's not just in some stadium. The only other ones who've had the privilege of appearing in those situations are the Pope himself and a rally previously by Billy Graham, who also was a 33-degree Freemason. And the Pope is blessing this, and he calls it together. And what are they saying? Pope Francis held up a black t-shirt adorned with an American flag last week on YouTube and urged young people to journey to Washington this month. Wear this t-shirt in unison and respond to the great restlessness. He's calling one million Christians to journey to the National Mall on July the 16th for a day of unifying prayer. We want to come together. We need to solve the problems of this world. We need to get rid of inequality. We need to get rid of racial hatred. We need to get rid of everything that divides us. And if there's one thing that can unite us and can heal the family, then it's Sunday. And he's made that quite clear in his encyclicals, even the encyclical that was lauded by Obama that called for Sunday as a day of rest. And it was on the environment. The goal of Together is to get one million Christians to journal, journey to the National Mall on July 16. This is an, a tremendous signal to the world for a day of unifying prayer. Nick Hall, the founder of the movement, hopes to unite people of all kinds. Jesus welcomes you whether you're a Democrat, a Republican, or an Independent. He welcomes whether you're young or old, whether you're an equal opportunity employer. Dozens of major Christian musicians and speakers from many denominations will perform on stage near the Washington one Monument. Among them, Francis Chan, Lay Cray, Crowder, Hillsong, Passion, etc., etc. If we're singing the same songs together, then we can't yell at each other. They're going to perform. What does the Bible say? How will they come together? Will it not be with music, all kinds of music? Will they not bow down? Together is a modern day evangelical revival complete with TED talks, hip hop, and no politics. This week, thousands of evangelical Christians will gather near the Washington Monument for what organizers will hope will be a historic religious revival, the likes of which America hasn't seen in decades. As a modern day, One Together has heavy social media branding, major music from hip-hop to folktronica to hard rock and popular evangelists who know to keep the message. TED Talk, that means technology, entertainment and design. It seems to me 
that what is predicted in the Bible is happening before our very eyes. And the world is being prepared for the ultimate entry, which I believe will begin in 2017, when the hatchet is buried between Protestants and Roman Catholics at their great jubilee. And the others will follow, like the Swiss uh, evangelical churches, they will come on board early in 2018. Hall said his goal is just to hold a huge Love Jesus rally, something that has been mostly absent from the American public life since the days of Billy Graham. Everything now is protests. I'm against this. I hate that. We really believe there's a longing to come together. We don't have to agree on everything but we can come together around the hope of Jesus. He said there are moments when God's people come together and God does something that can heal, change, define generations. The sad part is that a longing of the soul is to be filled by all of these things. But sadly, there's a fulfillment of prophecy. Peace, peace, and what? Sudden destruction. Together is marketed as a huge day of Christian unity, a time when we will lay down what divides us. Politics, race, social issues, theological differences, to come together and lift up Jesus who unites us. Can you be united in error? Or can you only be united in truth? Although the lineup is entirely evangelical, except for a greeting from Pope Francis via Hall, some prominent evangelical leaders said the racial and gender diversity of the people who will be on the stage is groundbreaking. Around half will be non-white and perhaps a third will be female. The world longs to come together. Revelation 17 verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest, which is exactly the same as the ten toes, the feet of iron and clay, are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. How will they do that? By asking the governments of the world, the new, friendlier, kinder, gentler leaders of the world, to implement legislation that will honor the first beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. The worst for me is that these people that will come together, and everybody who is in solidarity with them, have good intentions. There are some deceivers amongst them, yes, who are running the program and pushing their agenda. But the people themselves are misled. And they don't see that when they rush into this movement and when they think that the problems will be solved, that they are actually creating the greatest problem of all, setting aside the authority of God for the authority of man. And they will have negated, when they finally get to that point, every single one of the principles instituted in Eden and have made of non-effect the government of God. And it's up to us to warn the world and to tell them that the time has come for this church to play its role in the world and to teach people that the only way and the only kingdom that we can long for and hope for is the kingdom of Jesus Christ, where he is the ruler of the world, and where social justice is by his agenda and not by the world's agenda. Amen. Heavenly Father, as this world rushes towards a precipice, thinking that is trying to solve the problems of this world. The only thing standing between them and death is the truth. The truth as it is in Jesus. 
Help us, Lord, to make sure that these people can hear the truth. And the truth has three components. You are the way, the truth, and the life. All your commandments are truth and your word is truth. Help us to build a foundation that is on a solid rock and help us to witness to others to this effect. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.